This is Dr. Neil Burney. He lives in Bermuda, a stunning Atlantic island 640 miles east of North Carolina, USA. So now the, yeah. He spent the last 30 years practicing veterinary medicine, but now he's transferring his veterinary skills to help save, protect, and learn more about the incredible marine life of Bermuda's ocean. This is a completely wild shark. Alongside his dedicated ocean vet team are a number of scientists, yeah, this and here, marine this biologists, off the back fin. and specialist master divers, helping to perform a number of unique and dangerous procedures in a bid to safeguard critically important marine species. Together, the team will be fitting satellite tags to huge tiger sharks, saving precious green turtles, dissecting giant blue marlin, and obtaining unique toxin samples from 45-ton migrating humpback whales. Yay! Whoa! My knees are like jello. Yes, man. This is Bermuda, home to Dr. Neil Burney, the ocean vet. Tiger shark is one of the world's most powerful predators. Millions of years of evolution have seen this beautiful animal rise close to the top of the oceanic food chain. But this stature has come at a price. Local and international fishermen target this species, among others, for their fins and liver oil. Consequently, the tiger shark is now classified as near threatened. Just, you'll just support if I start to go. Sure, sure. The Ocean Vet team are coming to the end of an eight-year tiger shark research project. Little was known about this impressive predator. The project was established to tag and collect critical migratory data while learning more about this animal's behavior. These animals are absolutely spectacular. They're a hydrodynamic marvel and beautiful to watch. Neil and his team's research is helping local and international authorities establish shark protection policies. I got to be honest with you, I'm calling this possibly the biggest shark we've ever had. This thing is monstrous. In this episode, Neil and the crew struggle with an 800-pound tiger shark while attempting to fit its satellite tracking computer. Neil's unique set of veterinary skills are tested and the team's experience pushed to the limit. Trim up, Starboard please. Engine up. Starboard engine, trim it right up quick as you can. Go, 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 go. Under the water, the team risked their lives to learn more about tiger shark behavior while attempting to dispel the notion that these animals are mindless man-eaters. Okay, I'll pull it out from under. The final $6,000 satellite tag will provide the data needed for the government of Bermuda to establish a comprehensive shark conservation policy the first of its kind in Bermuda's long history. As Neil and the team prepares to embark on this epic adventure, Neil carefully checks the equipment needed to secure a huge tiger shark to the side of the boat. This is the sling in which we suspend our large tiger shark when we get into the side of the boat. It has to be adjustable both ways so that we can roll him rotationally to position his dorsal fin for drilling. We're going to take a measurement. Series marine biologist Choi Ming has been studying these sharks with Neil for over the last eight years and has made some interesting observations on their behavior in the wild. Now, obviously, we were cautious when we first jumped in, just uh, didn't, ha didn't have any idea what to expect. But over time, we've definitely seen that they're not the mindless eating machines that you think they are. In fact, when we're in the water, if you hold your ground and assert some dominance in the water column, not aggressively towards the animal, but you just hold your ground like you're a large predator, they'll keep their ground. And we've stayed in the water well over an hour on a couple occasions with multiple tiger sharks. So it just goes to show that once you understand the psychology of the animal, you can do a lot more than you think. Swimming with tiger sharks is dangerous. The team have had years of experience developing a unique understanding of shark behavior. Neil and Choi believe that by sharing their incredible interactions, they can change people's perception of tiger sharks and sharks in general. 
As always, Neil and Choi are supported by the rest of the Ocean Vet crew. Andrew Kirkpatrick is the underwater cameraman and doubles as underwater support during veterinary procedures. Dylan Ward and Neil's son, Oscar Dois, are the shark safety divers. Together, they ensure the safety of the team. The tiger shark tagging location is a 12-mile burn southwest of Bermuda to Challenger Bank. This seamount is one of two underwater volcanoes. It rises up from well over 2,000 feet and comes close to the surface at just under 180 feet. Before the team reach Challenger Bank, their journey is interrupted by something rather special. So as we're traveling through the deep oceans, we've come across a pod of bottlenose dolphin, and they're actually right in the bow with us. There's about 30 of them. We're going to try and see if we can get in the water and swim with them. These bottlenose dolphin are actually a specialized subspecies of deep diving dolphin. The dive patterns of these mammals correlate with vertical nightly migrations to over 6,500 feet. They hunt for prey on the steep-sided Bermuda pedestal. The opportunity to interact with such a subspecies is extremely rare. As always, Neil manages to do so in his own unique style. All right, sir. It's the first time I've used this fin and anger. This is a uh, Lunacep Pro by Tenchi Miller. This thing makes you swim like a dolphin, and I swear, that dolphin, we think it was a big male, came in as if to say, what in heaven is that thing? Let me take a closer look. And he came right up, and then we swam across each other, and we swam together. It was uh, incredible, just man. So good. wicked. <laughs> it was exactly what I wanted to do with this fin. Humpbacks next year, this is going to be the deal. <laughs> With spirits high, the team switch gear back to tiger sharks. Choi is preparing the chum. So you can see Dylan and I here at the chum table, and basically we're making chum for the sharks. So what we have down here is a soup of uh, blood, guts, fish, just general nastiness. Now, the way we get a shark coming up is to actually attract them by sense of smell. Sharks have a fantastic sense of smell overall. Most sharks can detect about one drop of blood in a million drops of seawater. These animals track scent lines for hundreds of miles. In the wild, these lines usually direct the sharks to a feeding opportunity, more often than not a bait ball. Neil uses a slightly different payoff for when the sharks arrive. So this is a large blue marlin head. We get these from the sport fishing fleet, and the body of the fish hopefully gets used for some research, but the head becomes the centerpiece of our chum line. This is what the tiger sharks love to chew on, and when they're playing with this, they're less focused on us while we're swimming with them. So, Joy, let's get this in the water. Yeah. Three, two, one, one go! go. Once the head is in position, Neil jumps in and heads out to the marlin head. Tiger sharks are already in the area, attracted to the chum, but they're keeping their distance. To bring the sharks closer, Neil starts to scrape the marlin head with a knife. The sound travels through the water column and is picked up by the shark's lateral lines, a sensory system located along the side of the shark that converts movement and vibration into electrical impulse signals. Moments later, Neil spots a large tiger shark rising up from the deep. So while I was scraping the head, one of the sharks did come up and say hello, but he headed back down to the deep. So now I'm going to send this little chew toy down for him to play with and then hopefully bring him up to the surface where we can get in the water, swim, and observe the behavior of these animals up close. Neil's tried and tested methods have now brought multiple sharks right up to the marlin head. Their interest in the bait is now at the critical level. It's only once the sharks are engaged with the bait like this that Neil and Choi feel happy to enter the water. Okay, so in the last few moments, we've had three tiger sharks turn up in our chum line. So we're getting ready to get in the water and swim with them. Why would we want to get in the water and swim with three large tiger sharks? 
We want to observe their behavior, how they interact with one another. Very little research has been done on this and we aim to increase that amount of knowledge. People think, is it dangerous? Well, if you appear to be dead, dying or dumb, then you deserve to be on the Tiger Sharks menu. But we're gonna act like other sharks. We're gonna swim at them if they swim at us. We're gonna show you that they're not to be feared, that they're to be respected. We want you to like these fish so you don't kill these fish. It's clear from the outset why Neil and Shoy enter the water during this period of high activity. Over the years, they have learned that the bait draws the attention of the sharks away from themselves, where most people would consider this to be the worst time to jump in. It is, in fact, by far the best. The animal's inquisitive nature allows Choi the opportunity to take some photographs. These will be cross-referenced against Neil and Choi's database of shark photos and enable the team to see which individuals are back in Bermuda from their oceanic migrations. Well, that was amazing. Uh, four large tiger sharks. One of them's obviously been hooked by somebody else, had a long leader and some spectral line coming off him. But what an amazing experience to see these sharks swimming close to us and to interact with not only with us, but with each other. Just amazing. Whew. Over years of observation, the Ocean Vet team have been able to unwrap some of the secrets of tiger sharks. These animals do show interest in Neil and Choi, but they also carefully watch one another. The animals make behavioral decisions based on the size and actions of other sharks in the area. As one feeds, others patiently wait their turn. By understanding this social order, the sharks accept Neil and Choi as other predators, enabling them to swim with the tigers in relative safety. Back on board, the team are reminded of how quickly things can go seriously wrong. The shark just took the, the, the buoy right under our starboard engine. He's in danger of breaking the lower unit off. The shark swims around and heads straight back towards Choi. Unbelievably, he jumps in. In this slow motion replay, you can just make out Choi's foot pushing the shark free of the engine. Choi is now some distance from the back of the boat. Disorientated and with no safety team, he's in danger. Sensing an opportunity, other sharks start to move towards Choi, following him right back to the boat, where he eventually manages to climb to safety. That was a big nine or 10 foot shark just dominating the scene with three others following in suit, almost bumping off each other. That was a fantastic encounter. So after a couple of hours of multiple tigers chewing on it, that 100 pound marlin head has been reduced to this, probably about eight pounds in weight. They've almost torn the chain right the way through the skull. And they also chewed through our rope and have nearly chewed through our 2,000 pound stainless steel cable. With so much shark activity, the team decide to push forward. Next, they'll attempt to catch right. one of these Let's huge up. sharks to fit the final $6,000 satellite tracking Sorry. computer. Neil lowers a single steel fishing line with a baited circle hook. It's not long before a tiger shark oh. takes the bait. I think somebody's playing with this one. Oh yeah, here we go. Tiger shark on! There is a serious risk of being pulled overboard when fighting such a huge fish. Neil uses a body harness to support his back and Choi stands by to assist with additional weight. Uh, basically, I'm just bracing Neil. What happens is he's actually come from the back of the boat, so he's higher up on the step here, and obviously the, uh, so his uh, center of gravity is a little bit higher, and also the shark's getting close to the boat, so he's getting a little more, uh, a little more squirrely. Under the water, Kirkpatrick is watching the shark as it gets closer to the boat. 
The lion has caught the shark on its tail and rolled him onto his back. The shark is now in tonic immobility, a trance-like state that sharks experience when upside down. Uh, we believe this fish may be tail wrapped as he was running straight away from the boat. The leader has caught around his tail, so we're bringing him in backwards. Yeah. Choi spots the shark break the surface. As it does, it triggers the shark's senses and suddenly rolls over and powers towards Dylan. OK, so this fish is taking a powerful run off into the distance right now. That's a serious run, man. Yeah, you Don't know what? a big guy on there. I didn't check this either. This is the rod that I lent to somebody else. I don't think it's running that direction right now, though. Andy. With the added concern that the equipment isn't in the best condition, Neil starts to regain some ground on the tiger shark. Unbeknown to the team, this tiger shark is the biggest shark they've ever encountered in Bermuda waters. You're going to have to loose the anchor briefly and let it go over my head. Try to cut up a bit. Is it good? Yeah. This is a big tiger shark. You can see what we mean with the tail wrap. He gets it on his tail and then comes in in this position. And you can see the huge claspers. It's a big boy. The first and most important task is to immobilize the shark's power using a strong but soft Good. tail rope. Good job, buddy. Neil and his team work quickly to rotate the shark so they can slide the harness around the animal and secure it to the side of the boat. But with a shark of this size, that's easier said than done. I got to be honest with you, I'm calling this possibly the biggest shark we've ever had. This thing is monstrous. I can tell you the weight when we measure it, but this is huge. With the shark now safe and secure, Neil and Choi can begin the tagging procedure. So we've assessed our shark. We think he's about 900 pounds, one of our largest tiger sharks that we have here in Bermuda. So we're going to fit him with our three battery extended life spot five tag. It's quite big tag. It's often used on the great whites, but it's not too big for this fish. He's a monster. These tags collect migratory data. Over the last eight years, a number of tiger sharks have been tracked all over the Atlantic Ocean. These tracks have revealed Bermuda to be a key habitat showing individuals returning year on year. This is the crucial information the team need to help protect the species in Bermuda. Back on the boat, Neil and Choi have the last sat tag in place. Um, well, basically, we're putting the satellite tag as high on the fin as possible so that the antenna reaches up. We're bolting through. The tag's on one side. We have a washer and a lock knot. And we have plastic bolts so that it doesn't rust in the animal. Just all whole thing about animal safety. And we'll snip them off and make it as streamlined as possible so it affects the swimming at a minimum. Yeah, this is a huge fish. Yeah, I think so. To secure these tags, Neil has drilled small holes through the animal's dorsal fin. This looks distressing, but sharks have very few nerve endings in this part of their body. It is a relatively painless procedure and a very small price for this one shark to pay for the benefit of its entire species. I just think it's tragic how many sharks are being killed needlessly for their fins, for game fish, for sport, just for putting their teeth on a wall. And we don't understand enough about the migratory patterns of these fish. And this study is going to allow us to learn so much more about how far these fish travel and their fact that they are truly international migrants. So you can see the tag nicely right at the dorsal fin, right at the top. So when he comes to the surface, that antenna is going to come out. This point of the shark tag will dry, and that will tell it to transmit. I'm going to trim away the surplus plastic, being careful not to throw it in the ocean, where it would add to the plastic pollution that we're already dealing with. The shark has been in Neil and Choi's care for just over 10 minutes well under the 20 minute release target. Now the tag is in place, Choi is able to move in and collect the information required to complete the data package. Excellent. Cool, 10 foot one. All right, so it was 10 foot one overall, which puts it in about the 750 pound range in terms of sharks. And to the end of the tail, it was about 12 foot four. 10 foot sharks are usually in the area of about 15 years old. So this guy's been around for a while. Judging by the size of his claspers, I'm sure he's reproducing. The team are now preparing for the shark's release. Neil's veterinary skills are key to this final step. 
The shark is tired and will need Neil's assistance to swim free. Over the course of this project, Neil and the team have successfully released all their sharks, but as this is the last one, the pressure is on to get it right. So, I'm just gonna check his nictitating membrane to make sure he's vigorous, and I'm gonna look at how he's breathing. The nictitating membrane test is a simple reflex examination. The shark's protective eye cover closes upon Neil's gentle touch. This is a good indication of how alert the shark is and enables Neil to predict how the shark will behave once the straps are released. Nictitating membrane is good, came straight over his eye. Neil then checks to see if the shark has flow over its gills. Again, this indicates how alert the shark will be when it's set free. And he's gulping water, so he looks good. I'm happy. These fish are so vital to the marine ecosystem. I'm delighted that we've been able to capture this guy, have him in good shape, and we're going to let him go. I'm going to wish him well on his journey. And hopefully, we're going to change the impression that the only good shark is a dead shark. Neil carefully uses large bolt cutters to remove the hook. There is inevitably a small amount of blood, but nothing that won't heal quickly. Look, he's clear. All right. Finally, they release the sling. Neil takes hold of the shark okay. and begins to swim this massive predator away from the boat and back down into the ocean. Since the filming of this project, the Bermuda Department of Fisheries has received a comprehensive map of over 100 tiger shark migrations. As a result, the Department of Fisheries is developing its first comprehensive tiger shark conservation strategy, a policy that will hopefully protect all of Bermuda's sharks throughout the island's 200-mile exclusive economic zone. This shark, named Andy, is again free to roam the open ocean. Uh, that fish was a bit slow to start. I gave him a push for about 20 meters, and then I could feel him start to kick. And then he started to kick away, and I actually went down with him. And he decided, no, he wanted to come back up. He came back up and swam away just at the surface. Some tiger sharks like to cruise the surface. This one did. Woo! Next time on Ocean Vet, Neil and the team delve deep into the world of the mighty blue marlin. Sure he's gonna hold him up, I'm gonna plop the tag. After hours at sea on a mission to protect this species, they successfully place the first of many satellite tags. That's it, the tag is in, the B-side tag is deployed in this fish. Back on land, they receive a massive blue marlin from the Marlin World Cup and prepare to perform the first ever televised dissection of an Atlantic blue marlin. So here's the swim bladder. We can actually remove it from the fish. The team's goal is to reveal the anatomical secrets of this remarkable ocean giant. This is Dr. Neil Burney. He lives in Bermuda, a stunning Atlantic island 640 miles east of North Carolina, USA. So now I'll be, yeah. He spent the last 30 years practicing veterinary medicine but now he's transferring his veterinary skills to help save, protect, and learn more about the incredible marine life of Bermuda's ocean. This is a completely wild shark. Alongside his dedicated ocean vet team are a number of scientists, yeah, this and probably, yeah, marine this biologists, off the back fin. and specialist master divers, helping to perform a number of unique and dangerous procedures in a bid to safeguard critically important marine species. Together, the team will be fitting satellite tags to huge tiger sharks, saving precious green turtles, dissecting giant blue marlin, and obtaining unique toxin samples from 45-ton migrating humpback whales. Yay! Whoa! My knees are like jello. Yes, man. This is Bermuda, home to Dr. Neil Burney, the ocean vet.
humpback whale, one of the largest animals on planet Earth. For the Ocean Vet team, they represent the biggest animals they've ever worked with. I don't want to spook it. It's right here. Oh my gosh. In this incredible episode, Neil will be using a modified bow to perform a unique humpback whale toxin study. Biopsy taken. We've got the biopsy. Jump for the boat out of gear. Yeah. Neil and the team will utilize the tiny Ocean Vet inflatable getting dangerously close as massive male humpbacks compete for female attention. Under the water, they come face to face with these ocean giants, swimming with them in what proves to be the most magical of all their wild encounters. All right, the one on the left is the one. In recent years, these gracious and powerful mammals have been protected but now the presence of man-made toxic chemicals in the ocean could be seriously affecting their health. Persistent organic pollutants come from pesticides, solvents, plastics, and other industrial processes. Once ingested, they can cause serious health problems that can lead to the animal's death. One's right on the left. The Ocean Vet team's mission to sample blubber and test for these chemicals should prove that so much more needs to be done to ensure these wonderful animals have the best chance of survival. Perfect. Didn't even flinch. Didn't even flinch. Preparation for a project of this scale requires the entire Ocean Vet team. Biopsy kits, I've got. Controlling the samples and keeping an eye on contamination is the Ocean Vet marine biologist Choi Aming. Yeah, no, exactly. That's why we. Andrew Kirkpatrick is the team's underwater videographer. Oscar Doyce is Neil's son and a seasoned whale spotter. And last but not least, Dylan Ward is the team's second boat captain. Sure. Uh, BCs and like Heading out in the winter months requires some serious planning. Safety, as always, comes first. Hey, Bearings, 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 this is Bermuda Radio. A very good morning to you guys. Yeah, good morning, Craig. We have six persons on board and two other vessels heading out to Challenge Bank in pursuit of the mighty humpback whale. Over. Humpback whales typically migrate 10,000 miles, 16,000 kilometers a year. They give birth in tropical waters during the winter, then migrate to polar waters in the summer to feed. It's during these massive migrations that the whales arrive in Bermuda. They seem to congregate on Challenger Bank, one of Bermuda's underwater seamounts. We're just heading over. We've got three whales at the surface. It looks like they are what we call player whales. They're interested in these three boats, and they're surfacing. They're just going on a dive now, but we hope they're going to come up and interact with us under the water. The rib drops the team in the perfect position. Neil's incredible diving abilities enable him to hold his breath for much longer than most. As he passes through 50 feet, a playful humpback whale falls into view. We have just seen a lot of whales. We have on a, on a pod right now. We got Choi and Neil in the water swing with them. Looks like they're right below him right now. Um, it's just amazing. We've had so much good footage in such a short period of time. Just being able to uh, swim with these animals and get so close is absolutely amazing. It's been, a, it's been a great day. Gradually, the whales become more confident. More whales join the pod. Eventually, there are so many, it becomes impossible for the team to spot them all. Right here, Neil! Neil, right here! Neil! Neil! It's clearly not easy to spot 40 tons of whale passing over your head if you're already watching 40 tons of whale passing under your feet. The 
The whales are now fully interacting with the team. They appear to be intrigued by Neil, Choi, and Kirkpatrick. In the same way, the team are intrigued by whales. There is undeniable intelligence. It's thought that humpback whales may share our kind of intelligence. They have specific brain cells previously thought to only exist in humans. The result is cognitive awareness. They are emotionally driven and highly social creatures. At one point, I had two whales suspended below me, just hanging there, just completely still. And I managed to swim down and probably get within 10 feet of one of them. And then as I got down to him, he turned and gave me a full profile, looked me in the eye and swam away. Priceless. When you swim with these whales, you get a profound sense of respect and empathy for these creatures. It is, uh, it's just a privilege to be able to swim with them like that. Endurance, oh, endurance, no, no, no. endurance. This is bones, bones, come back. There are several whale spotting boats on Challenger Bank. Communicating with these boats provides the ocean vet team with specific coordinates to the whale's locations. The report confirms several pods on the southeast corner of Challenger Bank, an area well known for its abundance of wildlife. This is the location for the first biopsy attempt. The health of these whales is being threatened by the amount of plastic being dumped into the oceans. And as these whales filter feed, they take in 50,000 liters of water, including all these little microplastic particles that break up. These animals are so beautiful, so gracious, and we are poisoning them. That's why it's important to me. So we have a whale ahead of us. He's lying on his side. He's waving his pectoral fin at us. He seems really comfortable. We're going to try and get a biopsy right here, right now. Forward, Joy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Forward, Joy. Yeah. Forward, Joy. Oh, no! No, it's no, okay. no, 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 no. I was too close. I allowed for a foot of drop, and it only dropped six inches. It went clean over the top of his back. Keeping up with the whales is extremely challenging. The sea is rough and the boat is extremely small. If a whale breaches and lands on top of the boat, it would seriously injure everyone. Here. Good. Stop the boat, stop the boat. You I run did, over I the... did, I did. I'm retrieving the line. I got a shot. It did hit the water's edge. We'll see if we've got the tissue vibes we need. There is a whale directly behind us. There are whales directly below us. We're in a large pod of whales right now. We have whale blubber. We have whale blubber. We have an, a biopsy. We've got skin and blubber from that humpback whale. Perfect. We've got probably five or six big pod. Looks like males jostling with each other. That's one of the reasons we can get in so close. Normally, we can't get up like this. Here. But because they're jostling with each other, they're more interested in each other than they are with us. So we can sneak in, get the biopsy. They don't know any different. Coming up, Neil and the team get dangerously close while attempting another biopsy. They stumble across a mother humpback at her calf. Neil takes a biopsy of his own stomach fat, and Choi heads out to investigate a dead sperm whale being consumed by massive predatory sharks. Back in the action, Neil and Choi line up on another humpback. Just call it, because I can't see. Move to your right, move to your right. Stay down, slow down, slow down. Keep going. Yeah, Forward. I'm going, I'm going. I don't want to spook it. It's right here. Oh my gosh. Yay! Whoa! Holy. Biopsy taken. We've got the biopsy. Just put the boat out of gear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's out of gear. It's out of gear. All right. Now, yeah, handle the arrow. Oh! Yeah, baby! That is whale blubber. We have a second, second tissue sample. And again, we've got skin right at the junction, and we've got blubber hanging out of the tip. So we've got a very good second sample of blubber that will allow us to assess for the presence of these pollutant chemicals. So the team have obtained their second biopsy. By the sound of the crew, it went rather well. The animal was keen to remind the team not to get too close to its enormous tail. 
Collecting the other three biopsies took some time, but eventually Neil and Choi got what they needed for a successful toxin study. Okay, so what we're gonna do now is uh, transfer our samples that we got on the boat out of the biopsy tips into some glass vials for freezing. Lay this flat. Yeah. We're gonna push this sample in past the barbs. You should be able to pull and oh, extract it. Look at there that, is the beautiful core. So we have skin at the top. Yeah, blubber and layer blubber underneath. underneath. Yeah, and the blubber layer, this fat layer here, that's where um, things like persistent organic pollutants, um, any kind of pollutants, uh, tend to hang out inside the uh, blubber tissue. And because whales are so fatty, they typically carry a lot of it. So there's one sample ready to go. We're gonna freeze these, put them in a deep freeze, and then they're gonna get sent off to Dr. Ken Drouillard uh, at the Great Lakes Institute for Environmental Research. And uh, what they're gonna do is do a toxicology study on these and just let us know what they find. So we're really excited about this. And all in all, that little sample, that is an awesome priceless. success. Yeah. That sample is priceless. Okay, are we good to go? I think we're good to go. We're good to go. Next, good Neil to is go. going to attempt to take a biopsy from his own stomach fat. This human tissue will be tested for the same toxins as the whales. The results will be used as a comparison with the humpback results. Before they get the chance to do that, they come across something rather special. We're here on Sally Tucker's Bank, just off the southwest edge of Bermuda, and we've come upon a mother humpback and her calf. They've made a thousand mile journey up from the Caribbean and she's been nursing the calf. We've just sent the helicopter overhead to get us some aerial views of this amazing scene. This calf is around 20 feet long and weighs around 1.5 tons. It's feeding frequently on its mother's fat, rich milk. There is a risk that this milk may be transferring toxins to this calf. As this young whale feeds, it may be innocently inheriting the health problems associated with these toxins. The very essence of life for this calf could be playing a key role in transferring contaminants from one generation to another. After working so closely and also swimming with these whales, I've developed a profound sense of empathy and respect for them. They've evolved over millions of years into highly intelligent creatures. Man started slaughtering them for their blubber in the late 1500s, and sadly, although illegal worldwide, we know the practice does still continue. If our research reveals the presence of toxins in these animals, perhaps we can all give consideration and thought to stop treating our oceans as some massive garbage dump. Back on dry land, Choi is preparing Neil for a rather unusual surgical procedure. So Choi and I here at Ensmeet, where I work on a daily basis, I'm gonna use the same biopsy cutting tip that we've used on the whales on myself to show that this is not that bad a deal. I'm gonna take a sample of my fat so that I can look for the presence of the same toxins that we're looking at in the whale. We're gonna use a very sharp cutting tip to make the first hole. I'm a little nervous about this. I've never done this before. So I'm just gonna be brutal. I'm gonna push this in. I'm gonna cut my skin right the way through like that. I've cut the skin. There's the skin popping out. I'm now gonna place the cutting tip on here, push that in there, and I'm gonna drive it in like that. I've now got a large sample of my own body fat in this device. There is no denying Neil Burney's commitment to the cause. He's just removed a large chunk of his own body fat and hardly flinched. In comparison, both samples are a similar size, but the whale blubber is considerably more rigid. So, so you can see from looking at this that we've got exactly the same thing. The difference is my skin is not black. My skin is kind of pink. But, and the blubber, instead of being white in the case of the whale, is somewhat yellow. Next, we're gonna place Neil's fat sample in one of our solvent rinsed glass vials, and then it's gonna be sent off to Dr. Ken Drouillard at the University of Windsor for analysis with the whale samples that we've taken from the biopsies. Sticky stuff. 
And finally, the final step is just to place a couple of little stitches in the skin to close this up. Job is done. This is how much it means to me to protect our oceans. During the biopsy, reports of a dead sperm whale surrounded by multiple sharks reached the team. The whale's blubber is an incredible source of energy for these sharks. Eventually, they will consume the majority of the meat and the sperm whale will slowly sink to the bottom of the ocean. To get closer to the action, Choi has climbed onto the whale. With hungry sharks in a feeding frenzy, this is extremely dangerous. This is absolutely mental. This must be what it's like to be prey. Choi moves his cameras right into the feeding zone, capturing some stunning video of tigers ripping and sawing large chunks off the whale. This type of wild feeding is very rarely seen. It goes to show how efficient the marine ecosystem is at recycling energy back into the food chain. Look at that! Look at the sawing motion! Oh, full mouthful! This is probably the most unbelievable thing. Three full-grown tiger sharks feeding off a whale carcass out to sea while I'm sitting on it. Unreal. Choi's experience with this sperm whale is a stark reminder to the importance of their humpback toxin study. As is the case of the baby humpback and its mother, these sharks will also ingest any toxins that reside in the sperm whale blubber. It's another reminder of how man-made chemicals can pass through the marine ecosystem. Okay. Yo, Dr. Ken? Dr. Ken, I'm pleased to meet you. I'm Neil Burney. How are you, man? Five months have passed. Samples have been analyzed by Dr. Ken Druyard, a professor in contaminant and bioaccumulation modeling from the Great Lakes Institute for Environmental Research in Canada. Ken has arrived in Bermuda to reveal the results. So, Ken, it's now five months since we took those biopsies from the whales and one from me. I'm dying to know what kind of results you've got from your studies. Well, um, the good news is, is the samples came in really well preserved and intact, uh, nicely labeled. We were able to finish the analyses. Uh, when we looked at the whale samples that you brought to us, a couple of interesting results came about, first of all. Uh, first, there were six whales. Three of them had a very different signature, different chemical fingerprint than the other three. So one group of whale is uh, basically more enriched in the industrial chemicals like PCBs. The other group is more enriched in the insecticides like DDT. And uh, when we compare that across different whale populations, what we, what we found is that one of these groups of whales tends to resemble a little bit more of the signature that's closer to the sort of the Atlantic uh, populations that have been sampled in the past. That's what we would expect from Bermuda. Right. But then the other, the other group tends to look a lot more, the ones that are enriched in the pesticides tends to look more like populations that have been sampled around the west coast uh, of North America. So, and again, yeah. without not knowing the, the life history of these sa samples, it, it does tend to suggest that these, these whales have different movement profiles. Okay, he's coming up hey, to the up, surface. Up, up. Right, Neil, pace it, pace it, ready, ready, yeah. Ken's results suggests that the whales oh, are using yeah, yeah, Bermuda yeah. as a mid-migratory meeting point. Yeah. They also show it's possible to work out where they spend their time by understanding the concentrations of chemicals present in different parts of the world's oceans. So I guess we should talk about your results, Neil. Uh, of course, we should talk about my results, yes. Yes, please tell us about his results. All right. So the good news is, is you have much lower concentrations than what we've seen in, in the whales. But in terms of your whales, your whales do have higher levels and there, if we compare them to the toxicity thresholds uh, for the same types of compounds, they're about a tenth of where we start to expect to see reproductive impacts and other associated effects. But, but comparatively, my fat to their fat out of their blubber, they're in worse shape than I am. They're in worse shape than you. So here, somebody who's living in an industrialized society, eating food out of plastic containers, sitting on flame retardant enriched furniture, and breathing a bunch of smog in, in the cities in England that I lived in, I'm way better off than these poor whales 
who are swimming in what until now we used to consider is a pristine ocean. It's food for thought and something that we should all be very aware of. We are poisoning our oceans. Here are these whales, they're ingesting food and they're swimming through a poisoned ocean and it's all man-made chemicals. Exactly. It's a sobering thought. So Chris, look. This is Dr. Neil Burney. He lives in Bermuda, a stunning Atlantic island 640 miles east of North Carolina, USA. So now I'll be, yeah. He spent the last 30 years practicing veterinary medicine, but now he's transferring his veterinary skills to help save, protect, and learn more about the incredible marine life of Bermuda's ocean. This is a completely wild shark. Alongside his dedicated ocean vet team are a number of scientists, yeah, this and probably here, marine biologists, off the back fin. and specialist master divers, helping to perform a number of unique and dangerous procedures in a bid to safeguard critically important marine species. Together, the team will be fitting satellite tags to huge tiger sharks, saving precious green turtles, dissecting giant blue marlin, and obtaining unique toxin samples from 45-ton migrating humpback whales. Yay! Whoa! My knees are like jello. Yes, man. This is Bermuda, home to Dr. Neil Burney, the ocean vet. Sargassum seaweed is one of the most unique plant species in the ocean. It gathers to form massive seaweed mats that can reach tens of kilometers in size. Drifting in the open ocean, this golden rainforest is key to life throughout the Sargasso Sea. So Bermuda is the only landmass located within the Sargasso Sea. And here it is, the golden rainforest, the sargassum weed for which the sea is named. These seaweed rafts have a fundamental role. They support an astonishing array of marine species, some of which are endemic to this unique ecosystem. It provides the basis of a food chain and habitat that is the cornerstone to all marine life found in the Sargasso Sea. I think I've got a sargassum fish. Get that whole patch there. In this episode, Neil and the Ocean Vet team are on a mission to explore this unique ecosystem. The team's goal is to collect sargassum species for a temporary exhibit at the Bermuda Aquarium. The sargassum environment, even though everything is small, it's very predatory and certain things will eat certain things if you put them in the same tank. So we have to be aware of that. Neil will also explore Bermuda's mangrove swamps to observe its rich biodiversity before heading out onto Bermuda's iconic coral platform to witness the maze of coral structures and stunning marine life. They will also complete a dive on Argus Tower, an old Second World War listening station 20 miles off the shore. Their goal is to learn how all of these environments are connected. I'll do the front, be careful of the tag, because I have the gloves. Finally, the team will satellite tag and release a wahoo. The Ocean Vet team wants to know more about this species' long-range migrations. Out in the ocean, hiding in the weed. The crazy little creature that you ever did see. If you get to find one, you get to make a wish, because this is the magical sargassum fish. We're going out today to collect the little creatures that live in the sargassum weed. The craziest of all is the sargassum fish. They make their living in there, and hopefully we're going to find one together with a bunch of other creatures. We're going out with the legendary collector, Christopher Fluck, who even has a seaweed named after him. We'll talk about that later. Chris Fluke, a.k.a. Flukey, really is a true island legend. He's worked in and around the ocean on various projects for years and was the Bermuda Aquarium's specialist collector. If it's in the ocean, Chris knows where it is and how to catch it. So, Chris, look. Great right to meet you, man. What are we doing out here today? We're looking through some of the sargassum mats that are coming through. Uh, this is a really good time for the sargassum. A lot of juvenile fish in it. I'm just gonna see what's in it. Um, just show what the, the true worth of it is. You know, this is floating gold right here. Excellent. Hopefully, I think we can find a sargassum fish, maybe? I hope so, yeah. That'd be golden. 
On this mission to collect species and explore the sargassum rafts, Neil will have the support of his trusted ocean vet team. They actually don't have that... Choi Ming, the series marine biologist, will manage the samples. Andrew Kirkpatrick will cover underwater filming operations. And Oscar Doyce will be the team's safety diver. On the back of the ocean vet boat, Choi is setting up the transport tanks for any animals collected. Okay, so what we're doing here is just prepping our little collection station at the back for the sargassum creatures that we are going to collect. So we've got various size buckets for the various size creatures and uh, even some really small things and a couple different nets as well so we can properly sort and examine our sargassum weed and all the little creatures in it. Yeah, he's floating a little too high. Over the course of this series, the Ocean Vet team have worked on projects designed to help save, protect, and understand more about Bermuda's incredible marine wildlife. These guys have been around so long, they actually predate flowers on planet Earth. This is a true living fossil right here. The team's focus on this seemingly insignificant seaweed is born from an understanding that the sargassum ecosystem supports nearly all of the wildlife that the team have worked with. Back on the boat, Neil is heading out with Chris to start looking through the sargassum raft. So there are two particular classes of little creatures that live in this sargassum. There are the transients. Those are the baby dolphin fish, the baby creatures that are going to grow up in the protection of the sargassum and then leave to go out and hunt in the open ocean. And then the second set are the endemics. The only place they live is here amongst the shelter of this sargassum raft. And that's the community. We're going to look at both those different types today. We got something in here. So Fluky's seen something. What have we got? Oh, nice. It's a... Oh, wicked, man. A sargassum pipefish. Pull that weed out. You gotta, we're going to pull the weed out just to show you this fish. It's actually a male because it's got, um, it's gravid. It's got, it looks like it's got eggs. Now, how's that for a statement? It's a male, it's gravid because it's got eggs. Flucky, can you just turn around and explain that? Why a gravid male fish has eggs? Well, just like with the seahorses, the, the male actually holds the eggs and, uh, and sort of incubates them and they hatch out of the male versus the female holding the eggs. Right. The advantage to that, I guess, in nature would be that the fact that the male tends to be bigger and stronger and has more of a chance of actually getting the eggs to, to growth. To uh, maturity. Yeah. So here he is. He looks almost like an eel. He's got a long nose on him. He's very slender. And he looks a little bit like a cross between a seahorse and an eel. And basically what he eats is the little shrimps and the little crabs out of the sargassum. So they live their entire life in the sargassum eating nothing but crab and shrimp. So so we're not going to put him in a bucket with anything small that he might eat on the way home, right? Exactly. Do you want to keep him in this one? Yeah. It's these tiny fish that start a food chain that ends up supporting top ocean predators. But the seaweed's importance to the ecosystem goes much further than that. As fish on the coral platform spawn, the eggs drift out into the ocean and hatch. Once they're fish, they find refuge inside these rafts, then swim back to the reefs once they are capable of avoiding the bigger reef predators. It's fundamental as a food chain, but it's also fundamental to the life cycle of other fish that live in completely different habitats. No, there's two fish. There's two fish on this plastic right here. We're gonna try and catch them right now. Catching these tiny fish is not as easy as it sounds. Chris decides to use a small seine net to improve their chances. Success! We have all three of the fish that were hiding under this piece of plastic trash. So you got an old, like, maybe a fishing bin or something like that, an old tub that's broken up and fallen overboard. There's so much algae and stuff has grown on this um, that it's basically made a, a, a floating house for these things. But it's just a shame that it's plastic as opposed to what's supposed to be here, the sargassum. This has got him. There's our first one. Oh, Baby, beautiful. Juvenile rainbow fish. runner. Look at that. This is almost like lucky dip. You get to plunge into here and you never know quite what you're going to find. Chris's net technique has been a success. Neil and Chris now have several different sargassum species ready for transfer to the ocean vet boat. So I'm going to give you these bigger specimens. Sure. 
Those are the going oh, the live yeah. well. Got some chubs, some little rainbows. That's great. Then these guys are the pipefish. Oh, that's a good sized pipefish. So we'll Excellent. keep them in one of the uh, gray tanks. Yeah. Choi moves the specimens into the transport containers, where he has the first chance to have a look at what they have on board. Now, right here, we've got a Bermuda chub. That's the small guy. You can see the polka dot pattern. They actually don't have that typically in the adult phase. And I believe that is an adaptation to camouflaging in terms of the sargassum when they are small and this size. When they get bigger, they are more uniform gray traditionally. This is a small triple tail, and this guy here, very interesting fish. This is a tiny one. This is uh, about the smallest I've seen it. They can grow to nearly a foot, also known as a leaf fish. Um, this guy will occasionally, we might see the behavior, he'll come up and lie on his side and disguise himself as a leaf. And he has this sort of patchy modeling coloring through most of his life and easily hides in the sargassum because uh, everything in here designed to camouflage. So that's a great little specimen. With the specimens on board, the team head back to the aquarium. All right, Floogie, we've got your exhibits. Right next to the first tank there. All right. Triggerfish in. Meet the Sergeant Majors. These different species are the bases of the Sargassum seaweed community. They form the backbone to the ecosystem found within the Sargasso Sea. Just outside are some bigger species Chris caught earlier. So, Flucky, what else have we got in here? Well, this is some stuff we got uh, the other day. And here we've got um, squirrel filefish, white spot filefish, plain head filefish, right. ju juvenile amoco jacks. These are a bit too big to go with our small guys who we've got inside because they would certainly have a feast, right? Oh, completely. We would come back in the morning and only have these guys. Yeah, back. but these are slightly bigger fish that are found in the sargassum. And then, of course, there are predators that will even eat these guys. So it's going to be a great exhibit. Looking forward to it. Completely. Before the team set up the exhibit, they decided to explore some other habitats to see how they're all connected. So we're out here 30 miles offshore, and we're located on Argus Bank. It's about 180 feet deep. But the cool thing is that there is a tower here. The US Navy blew this up over 30 years ago. It was a submarine listening station, and they dropped it in the knowledge that it would act as an artificial reef and accumulate a whole biodiversity of life here. And we're going to go down and look at it. Really exciting dive. All right, you're all set, bud. Yeah. yeah. Neil and the team descend down 100 feet to the top of Argus Tower. So this is the Argus Tower. It's exactly how I expected it to be. We're surrounded by pelagic species. We've got barracuda, wahoo, and giant amberjacks. What a fantastic biodiversity we have here. Many of the species Neil and the dive team are watching were once tiny juvenile fish that likely found shelter inside sargassum rafts. It's only because of habitats like the sargassum that stunning ecosystems like this exist. It's a stark reminder of how delicately connected each marine habitat is to another. So now we are coming to the end of our dive. The current's starting to switch. It's time for us to head back up to the surface. It's been a wicked dive, absolutely phenomenal. Back on land, Neil and the team are about to take a closer look at some of the species they captured during their sargassum search. So we're at the Bermuda Aquarium with some of the creatures that we captured during our recent trip to the sargassum raft. We've got some tremendous equipment here to allow us to get up close and personal with these little guys as they hunt and feed within the sargassum weed. While the team were diving Argus Tower, Chris managed to find a tiny sargassum fish. 
This species is endemic to the weed and has evolved perfect camouflage to feed on a variety of other fish. It's this feeding behavior the team are hoping to capture. The tension in this room could be cut like a knife right now. Everybody's watching. He could be waiting for a headshot so it gets in there. Yeah, that's what I think he's waiting for. This little sargassum fish is holding himself in position using his pectorals, just like he has two hands. I can see him moving up and down that branch of the sargassum. Oh, it's, yep, you got it, you got it. That little sargassum fish just ingested that chub. The little chub was probably two thirds of his own body length, and yet he managed to ingest him completely in less than a couple of seconds. Fascinating to watch. And now you can see the sargassum fish has gone back into the weed and he's sitting there distended. It's like me eating probably 80 pounds of food in one go. Outside, Choi is preparing the temporary exhibit and some of the children have started to arrive. So what a great opportunity we've got here. All these kids are absolutely fascinated by the sargassum community. Many of them had no idea what they're so, living in the middle of here in Bermuda. We're the only sea mount in the Sargasso Sea, and this surrounds them every day. So as you look at all this weed and all these organisms, what you gotta realize is that this stuff is so critically important for Bermuda because some of these little tiny fish that live in here, the sergeant majors, they'll actually end up on the reef out here. Some of these trigger fish end up on the reef out here. So this replenishes Bermuda's reef system. Also, all these little shrimps and things feed the reef fish as they come in here. And then the mangrove swamp does the same thing inshore down at Hungry Bay. And the reef itself nurtures these small fish just in the way the sargassum community. So it's all intertwined for Bermuda. Everything's vital to Bermuda's health. And now, for the health of these little guys, what we're going to do is we're going to load them up in the buckets and we're going to take them back out to sea. Them three little guys, they formed their own little school and they're heading back up into the weed where they all started. It's just been a great adventure out here in the Sargasso Sea. Back on the island, Neil and Kirkpatrick are exploring Bermuda's mangrove swamps. So we're here at a World Heritage Site. This is Bermuda's Hungry Bay mangrove swamp. And we're going to explore how these roots and this structure provides the same sort of support for small creatures that the coral reef does and the sargassum weed community does. Cool, ready to go? Yeah, ready to go, Drew. All right, let's get this gear in the water. The mangroves are another unique habitat. Like the sargassum, they provide shelter and food for a variety of different species. But even this border between the ocean and the land has its connection with sargassum seaweed. The tides push sargassum in and pull it back out. In essence, it's like a protective highway transporting species in and out of this habitat. So here we see the sargassum raft has been washed in and has blended in with the mangrove. The sargassum brings in food for all these juvenile fish and provides a safe route back out to the reefs. Bermuda has some of the most stunning coral reef on the planet. It's the most northerly coral reef ecosystem in the world. The scale of this ecosystem, when you consider how tiny the creatures are that make it, is astonishing. Over millions of years, many species have evolved in this gigantic underwater world and many have built links with other habitats, like the sargassum, to assist in their own miniature battle through their life cycle. It has to be, without question, one of Mother Nature's most astonishingly beautiful achievements. The team's final task is to satellite tag a wahoo, a fish close to the top of the sargassum food chain. 
The data will help the team better protect this fish and its important role inside the Sargassum community. So this is very exciting. This is definitely a wahoo. I could see his stripes. We're going to pull him into the stretcher, and we're going to put a PSAT archival tag in this fish if we get him into the boat. OK, so basically, I'm just prepping the station. Neil has the wahoo very close to the boat. So we're going to pull him up onto the boat. I'm going to lift, and you're going to guide his head. Yeah. Lift and pull. Neil and the team are using a pressurized enclosed stretcher designed to hold the fish in place during the tagging procedure. The main thing in keeping this guy alive is having water flow over the gills. Basically, we've got a high pressure hose running over. You can see water pumping out the back side of the gill. That keeps him breathing. It's basically almost like a scuba tank for humans, but for fish out of the water. So if you're going diving, you have your tank, you go diving, and you can breathe air. This is so he can respirate out of the water while he's in an opposing environment. So it's kind of cool. I'm seating this tag so it sits just behind this dorsal and trails behind him here. Choi and Neil must work quickly. Wahoo and other pelagic fish are very susceptible to stress. Neil has the tag placed and secured in seconds. So now he's trailing this PSAT archival tag behind his fin. It's going to get in front of his tail. It shouldn't interfere with the movement of his tail as he goes along through the water column. With the tag in place, the team decide to quickly release this fish. Yeah, he is. He's kicking. Yeah, OK. You in? All right, cool. So. You grab the back. I'll do the front. Be careful of the tag, because I have the gloves. So I'll take no, the point. Turn it around the other way. Yeah, 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 yeah. Good stuff. We're just. And then you're going to slide his head in. We're being very careful just of the tag. Under me. Yeah. OK. Three, two, one, go. The data from this tag will allow the team and the Bermuda Department of Fisheries to look at this species' local and long range movements. The wahoo is economically and ecologically important to the health of the entire Sargasso Sea. By learning more about this individual fish, the team can better protect its future and its important role inside the Sargasso community. Whoa! So, our first pelagic release. Uh, he swam away. He was a little kicking, a little kicking, and then took off. So I'm sure he's... Uh, He's in great shape. This tag released its data three months after deployment and is currently being analyzed by the Bermuda Department of Fisheries. Their aim is to understand its movements to help protect and sustain the species' numbers. So what a great adventure, exploring the Sargasso Sea. Bermuda, the only landmass that rises up within it. We've seen mangroves, we've seen coral reefs, we've seen the Argus Tower, we've seen the Sargassum weed community. And now we've seen one of the mightiest fish in the ocean, the wahoo, fastest fish that swims quite probably. And we've put a PSAT archival tag in this fish. We can track him on his adventures around the Sargasso Sea. How cool is that? Mm -hmm.